Oh no. Major glitch glitch. Yeah, you just froze as well. Are you back? You're back, back. now. You're back. Okay. Uh, carry on yeah. moving like this very slowly so that you know. Good evening and welcome to everybody. My name is Mike Brampton. And my name is Julian Hode. Very much. And we are glitching terribly, folks. Because your video has completely frozen. This, I, I've got a bad feeling oh, no. about tonight. Oh, no. Hey, if, it, it's going to be fine. People will be very understanding. Brenda will be very understanding because she'll know we've tried our best. Hi, I'm Mike Brampton. And my name is Julian Ho. Welcome to Veterinary Ramblings. So, Mike, who do we have this week? This week, we've got an old friend of, ironically, both of ours, um, who has left the the shores of the UK to find fame and fortune in the United States of America. Um, A gentleman we we know as Steve, um, but I think to his students, he likes to be known as Professor Stephen Divers. And- uh, Professor Stephen J. Divers, I think. Yeah, I think you're right. Professor Stephen J. Divers. And uh, Steve, Steve, a bit like yourself, um, he, graduated initially um, with a Bachelor of Medical Science Physiology from King's College London way back in 1991. I didn't actually know that until I looked him up, which would explain probably some of the links that I've had with him in the past, because I first met him when I was working with the training department of London Ambulance Service, which of course is all pretty much physiology. Um, And he then went on to take his uh, Bachelor of Veterinary Medicine from the RVC and that was in 1994. He's founder of Diplomat of the European College of Zoological Medicine, Diplomat of the American College of Zoological Medicine, Diplomat of the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons Zoological Medicine, Fellow of the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons and de facto Diplomat of the European College of Zoological Medicine and all of that sort of stuff and you and i know him as steve so let's get him in steve, he's in the waiting room steve and here's Yay. steve well you don't look very animated there steve <laughs> don't worry i'm turning on my video <laughs> do you know we, we are such professionals steve honestly these days it's slick as anything <laughs> within within an hour or two we can actually be on and recording it's brilliant <laughs> Well, it's only three thirty in the afternoon here, so I'm now I'm supposed to have a drink, but you're going to be very, very disappointed because I'm actually having tea. <laughs> I've still got work to do, but anyway. No, we, we, we would expect nothing less, Steve. I mean, well, you're, you're the Brit waving the flag in the in the United States. Julian, I have to say there is a significant lack of superficial foliage up here from when I last saw you. <laughs> it's gone. I, I, I was I was Mr. Curly Mop, I think, last time I saw you. You had loads of hair and then there was a significant I mean it was yeah. you had a hard yeah. time trying to find a area that wasn't sort of follicular. <laughs> and now it's like all it's all although Mike's not doing too much better on top either, to be fair. <laughs> well, Mike, Mike's still got the beard. He's hoping that eventually he can turn his right. head upside down and uh, yeah. recreate a normal, normal head of hair. Yeah. Steve, that's got to be, what, 20, 22 years ago, is it? Yeah, it's got to be something like that. Yeah, it's got, I mean, well, I graduated um, 94, joined Elands, and I think you, what was it, 96 or something? That's right, 96, yeah. 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 1996, and then I saw Phil Lamette on your show uh, what was it a few weeks ago or yeah yep. our first boss our first boss yeah yeah that uh, yeah that took that that brought some memories back seeing him actually he's grayed a little bit but that was probably more to do with his daughters than it was to do with us i suspect julian i, I think it's all to do with his daughters probably. absolutely yeah you, you yeah. keep telling yourself that steve <laughs> <laughs> you've picked up a little bit of a twang there steve haven't um, you um well, it sounds more Australian than American. I, yeah, so I get that now. Whenever I go home to see my um, see my family, my parents and my brother and my sister, they tell me I sound 
very American. Fortunately, the Americans still think I sound very British. And uh, <laughs> I don't, they, I think that they're under the misconception that I'm at like 322nd in line to the British throne. So that often gets me out of trouble as well. So I'm holding, I'm holding the cover sheet right. of, um, or a facsimile, I should say, a yeah. cover sheet of, of a very, very good textbook that, uh, that Steve has, has uh, co-edited. Yes. And it's, um, it's the Bible, basically, of, of reptile and amphibian medicine and surgery. Uh, Doug Mader. Uh, wrote the the previous two editions. Yes, he did. Really? He did. We, in fact, um, Doug, but, Doug and I worked on the current therapy, which was like a, 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 a sort of a current therapy version between the second and the third. But yeah, Doug wrote the first and the second. He edited that all by himself. Them, but uh, yeah. So this was like this is an interesting story about this, right? So this is like 125 authors, and. Yeah. Anyone that even considers writing a textbook, I suggest you do it yourself, because uh, trying to trying to herd mm. 125 authors is like trying to herd a bunch of cats after dark in thick fog. I mean, it's just a nightmare. But I, I take my hat off to you, Steve. I'm, I'm editing a, a, a BSc. Oh, email there you go. Email. You're going to find out. <laughs> well, 20 authors. Okay. And. And that's that's hard enough. Uh, no, mate. That's yeah, it enough. takes it takes some doing. So what's wow. interesting though is that what was uh, so every author, right? Because they don't pay you very much for doing these things, right? It's a love. Mm. It's it's a you know it's a it's a it's a it's a very altruistic sort of love thing that you do for the profession. You don't get paid a lot of money for doing this, but every author was supposed to get one copy of the book, right? And every editor, i.e., myself and Scott. Right, we were supposed mm -hmm. to get eight copies. Well, Elsphere made a little mistake. Elsphere sent every author, 125 of them, each author got eight copies of the book. Now, each book is 180 dollars. Yeah. So when you do yeah. the math, Elsphere basically sent out a quarter of a million dollars of books that they shouldn't have done. And then had to kind of clamor to get them back again. But anyway, they've managed to do it. So I think we may have flooded the market a little bit early with this. We'll see. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll reserve my uh, my edition tomorrow. I will actually. You know, so what, what what's concerning me is that as you age, every decade, there's something that happens. Like I remember when our twins, and Julian can attest to this, we had, there was a lot of partying that was going on. There was a lot of dreams going. In fact, the parties above the Elan's Veterinary Clinic was fair tour. Because I remember once Philip came into work and he said, I understand there was a party here on Saturday night. I'm like, how did you know? And he said, apparently they were talking about it in the, uh, in the hairdressers in town. So at that point, I knew we had achieved some degree of notoriety. But anyway, in my 20s, you know, you could drink. I used to smoke mm. and then in your thirties, you know, that has to kind of be curtailed and, and then you hit forties and now you have to be careful about what you eat and, you know, and stuff like that. And so I'm convinced the reason why people die is, is basically because people take away all the pleasures in life and there's nothing worth living for at that point. And so you might as well just pop cover. It. It's true. The, it's like a man who goes to the doctor and he says, if I give up wine, women and song, will I live longer? And the doctor says, well, yeah, exactly you'll right. Like so, you know, and I knew I was middle-aged when I, I think it was about 10 years ago, I was about 40, and I, I sneezed in front of the bathroom mirror and put my back out for two days. And at that point, I realized that middle-aged is when I'm truly here. So, anyway. Have you given up yeah. the motorbike, Steve? We're, we're on the way out, aren't we, really? Yes, thank you. Well, actually, I haven't... Uh, I didn't acquire another motorbike when I came over to the state. Came over in 2001, left the bike in the in the UK, sold sold the bike, um, and uh, the reason being is because they'd make take another test again. So I know you know at that point. I don't know. I just thought maybe not. I was getting to the now. I start. I'm more fearful. As you get older, I become more fearful of my own mortality. When I when I was in my twenties, it was like yay. Mm. Off we go. We'll bounce. It doesn't matter. But now I find I, was, I, I don't bounce anywhere near as much yeah. as I used to, right? I, I remember going on the back of your bike. Really? Because normally they were usually yeah. more attractive than you. But anyway, but fair enough. Maybe oh, you did. Sorry. That's fine. <laughs> Presumably, because I had hair, then you let me. Maybe, um, maybe. I, I was, I was, 
holding on behind. Every time I stuck my head out to see what happened, <laughs> I was pushed back and it's off the bed. You kept on saying, don't lean out. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> you leaned out, throw, yeah. throw, throw. Yeah, a lot of fun. <laughs> I did enjoy it. What was interesting, so when I came to the States, you have to do all these extra things, right? So you have to learn to, you have to take a driving test and, you know, which is fair enough, mm -hmm. but the DMV is notorious for being slow and, and very inefficient. But I remember I went and did the theory and they said, right, you got to go outside and do a driving, you know, a practical driving test. So I was like, okay. So we go out in the parking lot, I get in the car, they say, right, drive to the end of the, we're in a car park, right? Mm -hmm. And we drive to the end of the car, says, turn left. So I turn left. They say, okay, turn left, turn left again, turn left and park. Congratulations, you've passed. I'm like, you have no idea if I can turn right and you're giving me a driving <laughs> license, but it's, it's kind of the way it is over here. But yeah, it's a, definitely a, a uh, there's a culture, a culture shift, let's say, yeah. put it that way. <laughs> do you do you like it over there? So, I, there well, for, for so it's interesting, right? So there are certain things that, I absolutely uh, adore. I miss my family. Family and friends is probably the big negative. British culture, you know, the going to the pub and that kind of stuff I miss. So but we, what I've realized... We haven't done that for months. Right. <laughs> yeah. But what I've realized is that because I left in 2000, I left in 2001, I miss the England of 2001. And when I go back now, I don't quite recognize it. It's not quite the same place. You know what I'm saying? So it's kind of weird. Yeah. Um, but there are certain things like family, family things I miss and I try and get over there at least once a year. Um, but then what I've got over here is, you know, I work in a hundred million dollar state of the art, you know, academic teaching hospital and we've mm. got all the gadgets and I mean, you know, the caseload, the high referral caseload. So it's phenomenal. I mean, it really is. So there's, there's those kind of benefits. And I have to say now I'm in academia. I'd have a hard time going back to private practice. <laughs> Do you have pets? Oh, we have pets. Yes, we've got two cats, Tiger and uh, Nina. Um, and, and then I guess I have pets as well. I've got a, I have a marine reef tank. I have a 300 gallon reef tank in my office and a 55 gallon reef tank in my office. Wow. I emailed the building uh, manager and mm -hmm. I said, uh, can you tell me, is the floor of my office, is it like reinforced concrete or is it? Just... And he said, why do you need to know? I said, well, I just want to put a fish tank in. He said, well, how big is the fish tank? Well, a 300 gallon tank weighs, you know, two and a half tons or something. So, anyway, so I put my, I, and so what I did is got all my tanks in before the building officially opened because it's in academia there is a general motto which is you ask for forgiveness not for permission and so i thought if i get these tanks in they'll be immobile mm -hmm. and immovable and so they'll just accept them and they did but we did actually i did while well, putting it together spring a bit of a leak and so at the opening ceremony the dean did make a comment about the fact that we'd already had our first incident with a fish tank leak on the second floor but Apart from that, it's been it's been okay. What what sort of fish do you have in there? Oh, you know, like uh, Pacific tangs, uh, blue chromis, clownfish, those kind of things. But really, most of it is about um, is the corals. You know, the anemones, soft corals, uh, SPS. The whole system is probably it's a pretty expensive system. It's all computer controlled, so I can actually on my phone, I can actually show you that. Um, so this is in real time. Look, see, this is in real time. I can tell you the pH, the salinity. I can, can I can turn pumps off. I can feed fish. I can do all sorts. But it's the whole system's probably about 15, 18 grand, I would say. It's pretty expensive. Wow. And is it is it easy to keep going once you set it up? Well, it's a lot of hassle to take it back down again, put it that way. I mean, once it's <laughs> up and running, you kind of just want to keep it going, right? So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that could that can be problematic, but uh, mm. no, it's fun actually. I kind of enjoy it. Well, I used to have the tank at home, but I would spend so much time at work. By the time I come home, I'd sit down, you know, at the end of the day, and I would just sit down in front of the tank to admire it, and then blink, the lights would turn off, and it would be the end of the corals day. And so I decided <laughs> to move into my office so that every now and again I can just turn around and gaze at the mm. at the uh, undersea odyssey in front of me. You, you've swapped this undersea odyssey instead of doing cat vaccinations. 
Well, so actually, no, the replacement was that I used to do a lot of scuba diving. Right. And then, um, and then uh, I stopped doing scuba diving, um, largely because obviously having a young family and stuff is still able to do all that kind of traveling. So anyway, I, uh, so then I decided, well, how do I get my, you know, marine fix? And so uh, there were two, two basically ways to do that. Uh, one is that I have a marine fish tank in my office. And two, Sunday night is now fish and chips night at the Dyer's household. So that's kind of our, our approach. <laughs> this, this Do you think Georgie Hollis traditional Hollis. British fish and chips? Yeah? Mm, kind of. It's difficult to get cod in uh, in Athens, Georgia. Put it that way. It, it's more it's like fish. tilapia, Tala- breaded tilapia breaded. and chips. And it, but it's fish, fish and fries, though, isn't it? It's not fish and chips. Well, I've seen now that that true. If you describe it to other people, other Americans, I have to say fish mm. and fries because if I say fish and chips, they're like what fish and then like potato, like crisp or something. Well, crisp, yeah, yeah. So, uh, but that, but you bring up a good point. So, I actually have a list of Britishisms and a glossary in the hospital so that the students, because otherwise they get very confused because if we start talking about, you know, everything's going to go pear shaped, you know, it's sixes and sevens or, you know, we, whatever we say, chock a block or whatever, all the students are completely confused. So we have to have some Britishism summary on the board so they can keep track. But, Mm -hmm. but anyway, yeah, fish and chips. Otherwise, it's not cricket. Is no, it? exactly. You say you can't. So on the topic of cricket, you see, so I remember when I went over here, first of all, a friend of mine, Scott Stoll, the other co-editor of the book, we often would go to conferences together and we would share a hotel room. And, you know, as I, as I was now a, a U.S. citizen, I said to him, I said, you know what, you're going to have to teach me the, the, the rules of American football. And he said, okay, fine. Anyway, approximately six minutes later, that was done and dusted it's not a particularly complicated game <laughs> and so then he said, could you teach me cricket anyway two and a half hours later he is <laughs> no further down the road of learning about the intricacies of cricket i mean it just just you know just wasn't going to happen but it, it yeah. was a game invented purely to foil foreigners that, that's that's the reason cricket was invented i think so i think so yeah. so uh, there's a lot of work, isn't there, going into trying to um, engineer or, or sort of force the evolution of corals to live at higher temperatures and in different um, salinities, different conditions to make them uh, more robust given global warming. Is that something you're involved in, Steve? Well, so, okay, let's just be clear. I mean, uh, you know, coming, you know, the United States at the moment, our our Republican president, and uh, I'm from Georgia, which is also Republican, we don't refer to it as global warming, Uh right? We we refer to it, we refer to it as as climate change, because that sounds far less malignant. So that's kind of the term we should Mm. use. But to answer your question, um, I have not been involved. Um, I've done some work on some coral diseases with ecology, but not a great deal. This is definitely like a hobby thing rather than a work thing. Um, most of the fish stuff I've done has been things like, um, uh, well, let me think. We did some endoscopic uh, gonad evaluations and biopsies in endangered sturgeon, and we've done some um, sturgeon sonic transmitters and implants and implantations and things like that. So caviar to the masses, so to speak. (laughs) Right, right. Yeah, that was on the Mississippi River. And I had these idyllic visions of, you know, Tom Sawyer and, you know, (laughs) Huckleberry Finn and floating down the Mississippi with a straw hat. Let me tell you, in January, it's very, very cold. (laughs) It was so cold that we used saline. It's a saline infusion rather than CO2 insufflation. So it's saline infusion that goes into the body cavity of the fish. The saline was freezing in the line before it got to the fish sometimes. That's how cold it was. It was so cold. You know those hand warmers, you know, that you can take when... So I'd I'd have hand warmers shoved in the inside of my surgical gloves and you could do about one fish and then you would sort of break your frozen tendons and put your fingers into your palm to warm them up again while they got the next fish ready. It was very cold, not pleasant. Was there a reason it's in winter and not in summer then? 
Well, see now, see that's where my my ignorance of of uh, you know the ecology of the Mississippi, because I just kind of immediately made the connection of you know Huckleberry Finn, straw hats, you know, you know <laughs> flip flops on a you know, so no one told me it was going to be that cold. But um, yeah, I don't think reading uh, reading Huckleberry Finn, I can't remember a time where it said so. Tom went inside, got his muffler and right, parker. Right. Right. Well, and so the way that, and it was run actually by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. So this was, it was more like a SEALs operation. They had these like, like fast boats. Everyone's in camo, right? Except the vets. The vets, they like to put the vets in a bright orange one-piece flotation suit with a bright orange clava on the basis that either we're an easy target if there's a sniper, or if we fall in the water because we'll be silly enough to do that, they can fish us out more easily. (laughs) <laughs> probably both of those reasons uh, really. probably both of those reasons you, you, let's admit it here you wanted a camo suit didn't you i did ask actually if i could have a camo suit and and i got one in the end i think it was by day two the first day i felt like a large i felt like a bit of a carrot shall we say but on the second day i did get my camo no At sir no those are operational procedures yeah. <laughs> so you, you say you were doing endoscopy on uh, on, on this uh, on this fish. That, that that's a that's a real love of yours, isn't it? Endoscopy. I do like the endoscopy, and it's interesting because I actually started that with Phil's practice. Yeah. I know. At, I at remember. Elance, right? You remember we were playing around <coughs> yeah, with that. Yeah. And it's interesting, right? Because you know, Phil Phil wasn't into it at the time then. But then he went on and got into it in a big way, and he became yeah. the editor of the BSAVA manual. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, he, he's, it's interesting. He's now the god of endoscopy in England. I know. The god of endoscopy in, uh, I know. in, in, in America. I remember. So I kind of, we, I think we tell the same story of this evolution that occurred in Elands from very different perspectives. I'm sure the truth is probably somewhere in between. Hey, I don't know. Can I share a screen? I want to show you guys something. I found a photograph. Oh, you've disabled it. Can you, I, I promise I won't do anything risque but i want to show you a I know. picture I, well i'm sure you're going to actually like. see it steve but yeah please do, let's see if that's um hang on is that allowed you okay to... here we go okay can you see can you see this picture <gasps> yes <laughs> this Gosh. this must be circa <gasps> i don't know i don't know this could easily have been when you were there, June. This could have been in 1996, to be fair, or, or <laughs> 1995. I don't know. But that's that's me as a new or recent graduate. And then you can see Phil there. He doesn't look much different, to be fair, right? But he anyway, he I, found that, I found that picture and I thought I had to show you guys because you had him on a couple of weeks ago. So. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, I remember that. I remember that uh, operating at a well, that prep room. Yeah, yeah, great. Wow, fantastic, fantastic. That's that's brilliant, Steve. <laughs> I'm holding up. You can't you can't see this, Mike, but I'm holding up an advert for um for an, an endoscopy training symposium that uh, that that Steve. Now, you have have you organised this? Have you been asked to? No, 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 we do that every year. This has been. Uh, since like 2004 every year we do really? a three-day course yeah at uh, uga and we've had people from we've had a, one or two people from england but we definitely get we usually get a few people from europe we've had people from australia korea china wow. um north america well obviously north america but also south and central america we have 16 people and we teach them the sort of basics of diagnostic endoscopy birds reptiles and mammals it's something that i that i enjoy doing and um when you're dealing with these exotic animals in fact do you want me to show you an example i yeah. love yeah. that we can chat about it i can i can show you hang on a second this is inside okay. so, so again i'm, I'm just i'm just gonna this a tall, um, fill in here for the people who can't see this because steve is showing us an endoscopic view of um of, of a turtle. the inside of a red-eared slider is that um red-eared turtle uh, for you it's a pseudomice scripter, isn't it? Almost. Trachemis scripta elegans, but that was a good stab. Well, pseudomice, I think, was the original name. Probably back in the 60s, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> and so you're doing a, a salpingectomy. You're, you're um, r- removing the, the ovaries and the, and the uterus, essentially. Yeah, so basically, you know what? I mean, and people love their tortoises in the UK, which is why I decided to show you some sort of tortoise 
uh, chelonium pictures, but mm. being able to do these kind of surgeries now, we can perform salpingo hysterectomies, we can remove uh, eggs, we can remove, actually we're, we're pretty good now for routine ovariectomy. We're doing this in sub-adult to adult females routinely before they develop reproductive disease. We can now go in through a soft tissue approach with the endoscope in front of the back leg, don't have to go through the shell. I mean, we mm. used to go through that shell. I mean, yeah, we made, yeah. we probably did some of those celiotomies back at Elans, and it's a much more traumatic, invasive procedure, mm. right? I remember mixing up the fiberglass for you. There you go. That's it, right? You remember? Yeah. Mm. God, so incredible. now we can avoid that by using these endoscopic techniques. And so, uh, so that worked out pretty well. So this was something, uh, this sort of endoscopic approach to re resolving reproductive issues is something that we, we developed in the clinic so we could avoid going through the shell. And then mm -hmm. here's a bigger example. This was a conservation project we did in the Galapagos. Okay. And so this is a giant tortoise. This was, and these, these, these were hybrids, so they weren't of any ecological that they weren't of any conservation value from a mm. breeding perspective, but they wanted to release these hybrid females onto the island of Pinkta to help engineer the island recovery because it was all getting overgrown because there was no tortoises on the island and they killed off mm. all the all the invasive goats. And so this is uh, just a video showing how you can take that 100 kilo tortoise and we can perform an ovariectomy without going through the shell. So anyway, this video is going to play, so you can keep chatting and we can keep talking, but I thought you might want to see that. This is excellent Absolutely stuff. Incredible. And, and again, for the benefit of those, those poor people who can't see this, or, or, or indeed for anyone who's, who's covering their eyes because they don't want to see it, <laughs> uh, what, what Steve is doing now is making, <laughs> making an incision through the, um, the soft tissue in the essentially the groin region of uh, one of these huge 100-kilo yep. tortoises. Uh, and he's introducing a, a little endoscope, the rigid endoscope, and, and identifying the, the ovaries. Uh, and he's then using, I imagine, do you use the ligature on uh, that? So I'll just, I'll just bring it forward a bit. So you go in with, your, with an instrument, and then you can put, you grab the ovary using the endoscope to guide you. And once you've grabbed the ovary and you pull the first part up to the skin, then you can just feed out the entire ovary out through that incision. And obviously, the yeah. good thing, because this yeah. is a this field site, right? This is the, the, the Darwin Center uh, in the Galapagos. So we don't have a surgical theater. And so the good thing about sort of this sort of endoscopic or endosurgical endoscope-assisted approach is that everything which is exteriorized is removed, right? Mm. You're not putting anything back. Whereas if you opened up the sea loam, you could imagine you could get a lot of contamination uh, yeah. of yeah. all the other viscera. But look at the size. That's one ovary. That's huge. Wow. Too. It's Massive. Something about the size of, uh, it looks like a, a, a bunch of grapes, but the grapes in this case are tangerines. <laughs> like, They're idea. almost tennis ball size, aren't they? Some of those. Mm. Yeah, some of them yeah. are like, yeah, three, two, three centimeters in diameter. Yeah. And so when you think we were doing about, we did about 39, 40 tortoises over about three, four days. So we're not using ligature, we're using radio surgery I here see, with yeah. hemoclips. Yeah. And, um, but I was like, uh, we're removing all this egg material. I was like, we must be able to come up with some kind of like recipe, like a Galapagos <laughs> flan or a, or a key lime pie or, you know, a, a, a something you would think. But yeah. Um, yeah. apparently we were, worried. I mean, you'll see, this is one ovary going into the bucket and we had sort of bucket, buckets of Galapagos ovaries. But um, so that's just that was just a nice conservation technique mm. that was developed from what we learned as clinicians, you know, in the hospital on the hospital dealing with people's pets. Gosh, it's absolutely incredible. I'd never, <laughs> I'd never tire of looking at endoscopic stuff. I, I wonder how squeamish some of our viewers are. But oh, um, that's push. Let's find out. Anyone that vomits, yes, going, anyone that vomits please leave a comment on the Facebook page. <laughs> Bre Brenda, if you're watching, Brenda from Burton, if you're watching this, please you know, vomit away, old girl. All right, now look at this. Now, this. Now, here's a good thing about global, not global, not a good thing, but here's an issue with global warming. A lot of these, Chilo all these Chelonians have temperature dependent sex determination, right? They're not genetically mm -hmm. determined to be male or female. It's the incubation temperature of the egg. So if the temperatures start to warm up, going to skew 
the ratios of our turtles and tortoises, right? So this was a project where they needed us to do a gender ID. And so what you're looking at here on the right, this is an endangered Asian box turtle. It's, um, uh, it is a Corora flava marginata, and it's, it weighs about 10 grams. So that's just under half an ounce for those of you outside of the scientific community. <laughs> 10 grams is, is about the size of a small egg. Yeah. So that's the stomach here, and then you can see the liver. It looks pale because it's really absorbed its yolk sac. Mm -hmm. And as we go cordally, you can see lung. And this is the intestinal tract down here. That's mm -hmm. actually Myrtle's diverticulum. That's where the yolk sac was attached. And then this is the gonad. And so you can now see that this is a very immature ovary, right? You see that? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Gosh. And then actually, as we get in closer, um, to give you some idea of the visual sort of acuity you can get with this equipment, you can now see the individual erythrocytes coursing through the capillaries. Oh my goodness. So you can. <laughs> so that's going from like, you know, a 100 kilo tortoise to a 10 gram tortoise. <laughs> this is incredible, is Steve. Absolutely amazing. Well, do you want me to show you another one? Are you bored? Oh, do you want please, to go? Please. What do you want to talk about? I couldn't get bored at all with this. This is a, um, a Gia Prairie Falcon. So this is a, a nice um, falconry bird. And it mm -hmm. was diagnosed with um, aspergillosis. So common fungal condition. Yep. There's the radiograph of the bird. They put it on the antifungal, but it got worse. And now you can see this big granuloma Ooh, gosh, just yes, here. It's huge, isn't it? And yeah, it's right yeah. over the heart base. So the question so is, is how do again, you get... Sorry, sorry Steve, the, for, the, for the listeners. Go on. So Steve's showing us some radiographs. And in, in the lung field, there's a rather hazy lump. Uh, it's probably the best way of describing it to, to, uh, to the lay viewer. And that hazy lump is caused by chronic inflammation and infection within that lung. And it's stopping the lung from inflating properly and stopping the parrot from being able to, to breathe uh, adequately. So, sorry, carry on. No, okay. So, it's, how it's do you falcon, get... It's a falcon, Julian. Yeah, it's a falcon, Julian, oh, sorry, not a parrot. <laughs> I, I, I was going to let that slide, Mike, but obviously he weren't going to. That's fair enough. Beautiful but plumage. How do you get... Yeah, exactly. Fjords, I understand. It's oh, not yeah. dead. Um, <laughs> But uh, how do you get access to this, right? And so some people have tried to try and get access to this area. You have to think about removing the keel. And though there is a very world-renowned surgeon who's actually attempted to remove the keel from birds to get to these sites, and they've all expired. It's not been successful. So I want to show you a video, and this is an endoscopic video. And so you can see the lung here. Mm -hmm. You can see this beating down here, which is the heart. And on top, this is this granuloma, this mass. And so we're yeah. using an endoscope to go in and actually debride and remove. And I'm only going to do this quickly, but just show you breaking down that membrane and then getting access to this infection and being able to remove it. And so this has been really, I think, you know, I, I'm a bit embarrassed really that how come endoscopy and endosurgery was developed for huge hulking you know 70 80 kilo humans i mean whereas when you're dealing yeah. with something that weighs you know grams or maybe a, a kilogram or two at most the endoscopic techniques make far more sense so you can see this actually isn't me now this is my resident um i'm actually just the camera holder on this particular case she's a third year resident so she's at the end of a training program so at this point we let them do and take more of a lead but you can see now she's removing this infection yeah and it's going to yeah. come out and gen so anyway that's you know i just wanted to share with you guys a couple of examples of those sort of endoscopic techniques but um, absolutely amazing and and did the did the falcon do well what julian if I'm not going to show you a video of an animal that basically expired like immediately <laughs> after surgery, am I? I mean, I, I mean, I have those cases, but I thought you'd prefer to see a success story. I prefer to see one. What I meant was, <laughs> did, did, it, uh, did it need much in the way of ongoing treatment? So, yeah, so what's interesting is that birds, to well, all animals, right, humans included, right, we tolerate these minimally invasive endoscopic approaches much more readily, easily, 
than a traditional surgery. You have a person that goes for laparoscopy, they're up and they're out hospital the next day. You do a major X lap and that person's in hospital for five, six days. And it's the same thing at the four, um, let me take that off now. It's the same thing um, for all these people. And so they, we find when we do these endoscopic procedures, the birds, the rabbits, the tortoises, they recover so much quicker, their hospitalization is reduced and they re re uh, respond um, quickly. A good example would be um, rabbits. So I do all my rabbit um, sterilizations now, the females are all done laparoscopic ovariectomy. And those animals bounce back very, very quickly. So Now, here's an interesting thing. Uh, I thought the view was that you had to do an ovarian hysterectomy in rabbits because of the rate of development or, or the risk of development of uterine adenocarcinoma. So if you remove the ovary before the animal reaches about, well, probably before a year of age, but we're a little bit more conservative. So we say, as long as we do it before nine months of age, we just perform a laparoscopic ovariectomy. And of the dozens and dozens and dozens that we've done over the last sort of eight years, 10 years, we've never had any come back. And I think the same thing, actually, I don't know. I actually, I'll ask you this question. What about um, the, the, the bitch, the female dog? Is it still recommended to do an ovariectomy or an ovarian hysterectomy? It's, it's a bit of a heated debate. And I'm going ah, to okay. in the field. For the last 10 years, I've done purely ovariectomies. Right. Uh, and for the last three years, that's been uh, laparoscopic. Right, exactly. And that's, I think that's the important point is uh, and we, we have those same debates in the US, but there's been, I mean, if you look at the peer reviewed literature, there is no doubt that a, the, that a laparoscopic ovariectomy is the procedure of choice if you can do it. And um, the whole concept of getting uterine disease, I think, falls away once you remove that endocrine component. I mean, it just becomes an involuted structure. So, but yeah, I do agree. I do agree yeah. that I wouldn't be doing laparoscopic ovariectomies in a mature, in an older animal, because I would be fearful that there could be pre-existing uterine changes. But we haven't seen it if we do it at nine months or below. But that's just another example of how we're using endoscopy as a routine part of the practice now. Yeah, we, we, we find it um, when we're doing liver biopsies right. or, or uh, uh, general abdominal biopsies, uh, they're, they're day patients now. They're right, exactly. Yeah, mm -hmm. same for, and what's interesting, actually, we recently published a paper in the vet record. I don't know if you saw it. It was an evaluation of the diagnostic uh, accuracy of things like, you know, history, physical exam, blood work, um, uh, imaging, radiographs. Um, endoscopy and biopsy for evaluating liver disease in parrots and what was in one way concerning and in one way um, revealing is that it doesn't matter all of those diagnostic procedures whether it's whether it's history physical exam whether it's blood work whether it's imaging they were not effective at diagnosing liver disease in birds even endoscopy you would endoscope and you might look at the liver and you couldn't tell if it was diseased or not but the biopsy the biopsy was the gold standard and so mm -hmm. i think you know that's what we're learning in birds but uh, i know you've got much more reliable clinical pathology tests that you can use for dogs and cats but ultimately you're right. You've got to get a piece of that liver tissue for a definitive diagnosis. And that's what we now strive to do on a, on a more sort of regular routine basis. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, gentlemen, I do a lot of ultrasound. Oh, gentlemen, yes. Yes. I finally got you. You got us. You got us. Mike. Hello, has Steve. <laughs> <laughs> so have you just been staring at a blank screen for the last yeah. 20 minutes? Well, the oh, last okay. hour. Yeah. <laughs> I was I was chatting to some of my some of my young younger colleagues at, at the practice the other day, and I was telling them that when I first qualified, we, we'd be down the pub, wouldn't we, have a lunchtime? Ah, uh, do they? Do people still do that? Do people know. still go to the pub on a lunchtime? No, you'd never dream of it. See, so, that's the difference. I I miss England of two thousand, not two thousand and nineteen. Now, I must admit, though, I was never a big proponent of going to the pub, and it was always only on a Friday, because if we went for a beer on Friday lunchtime, oh, my God, Friday afternoon, that was, that was problematic. That was just difficult. It's just, you know what I mean? The energy 
drains out of you. And I can't yeah. drink anywhere near the what I used to. I mean, my fridge used to be full of Guinness, you know. And you uh, actually, you oh. were a single malt person, if I remember correctly. McKellen? And, and Talisker. Talisker. That's it, Talisker. <laughs> other, other malts are available. But right. Steve, do, do you remember that guy uh, drove the practice because he'd found a snake crawling up his leg while he was driving? And so he phoned you and said, if I bring it to the practice, if I carry on driving to the practice, we will identify it. I, I take your word for it. I, obviously, there were so many unidentified snake stories that I can't pinpoint that precise one, but that doesn't surprise me. I mean, you, you I always do, used to say um, there's no such thing as a reptile emergency. That's true. You, you still stand by that. I still maintain that. I still maintain that it's pretty tough to convince me that I need to go in and see a reptile at two o'clock in the morning. You'd say to someone, okay, it sounds really urgent. I'd recommend you put a first class stamp on this one. Yeah, yeah. We should see it probably by a week on Tuesday. <laughs> now, the un but the or what usually happens is they're like, oh, it is an emergency. Um, it is an emergency because uh, it stopped breathing. And so they actually bring it in in the final throes of life, you know, mm. or actually even sometimes you can actually get the odor of – of, of death that's been percolating for several days when they bring it in. So, mm. I mean, sometimes they just wait a little bit too long. Mm. They do. Although I do remember someone sent you, was it a python uh, for a post-mortem? And he started doing the post-mortem and realized it was still alive. And so... So their hearts keep going. So they can actually be dead. You can actually have a completely dead snake. You can decapitate it, but its heart might keep beating for like a day or two. Yeah, it's, it, it can be a little off-putting to the less seasoned reptile pathologist, <laughs> to put it that way. Although I did have one situation. I mean, obviously, we never did venomous snakes in the UK, but in the US, we, you know, we see venomous snakes. And so there's a, you know, my approach is that you have to be, you have to be inappropriate to get bitten by a, a venomous snake, right? You're, you're doing something wrong to put yourself in that position. To get envenomated by an unconscious, anesthetized snake, obviously is, <laughs> indicates that there are probably greater problems with your abilities. <laughs> but I have actually had one case where a pathologist got evanimated by a snake that had been dead for three days. And I don't think there's any hope for those sorts of individuals. I just don't know what you're supposed to do. <laughs> I, I love the way you flip your mic up around your glasses there to have a drink there, Steve. So was the, well, yeah, yeah, was the, the pathologist okay? <laughs> oh, yeah, it was fine. I think they were just more embarrassed. And then, um, well, actually, so I got, I actually did get bitten by a beaded lizard once. Actually, there's been a few stories. I've been chased by a bison. I got bitten or I got, I got bitten by a beaded lizard. I, so you, we had this group of beaded lizards come in and so I'm working with residents. I'm like, I'm going to grab it. Right. Mm -hmm. you, have, you kind of, you have to be quite sort of, well, somewhat stupid to get bitten by a beaded lizard. They're not like really rapid, you know, like a mistake. They don't strike, you know, they kind of wander over, they sort of grab and then they chew on you a little bit. You know, it takes a lot of effort to get envenomated mm. by a beaded lizard. So I'd grab the lizard and then I get my resident to, you know, wrap up its head to, you know, as a kind of a uh, muzzle. And then we'd inject it and uh, ketamine, metatomidine or dexmedetomidine, and then we could work on it. So I grabbed this beaded lizard, my resident at the time, she wraps up its mouth. And I'm like, is it wrapped up? Are you, yes. Are you sure? Oh, yeah, it's absolutely wrapped up. It's secure. And then the animal suddenly moves, and I, I basically caught my finger on one of its teeth. So it was more a case of I pulled my finger against a, 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 its tooth rather than I actually got bitten. But anyway, it starts, you know, it's like with reptiles. They, they, you bleed quite profusely from their little mm. razor-sharp teeth. So blood starts dripping. And then, you know, my technician is like, do I need to get the car and take you to the hospital? Um, and the student says, but hang on a second, Dr. Davis, I thought you said you'd have to be stupid to get bitten by a beaded lizard. So, <laughs> but anyway, it was fine. It was just like one of those little things, but yeah, we have a few stories like that. And, so, and they're actually venoms then? Yeah, they are. Uh, they're native, actually. We have native... Um, we have a few... Yeah, we, I, that's the one thing I miss, the relationship that people have with wildlife 
is quite different in the UK compared to the US. I mean, don't get me wrong, we have a lot of good Samaritans that will bring in injured wildlife, but there is a lot more um, hunting that occurs in the US. Mm -hmm. um, in the US, so that kind of creates a little bit of a, a, a separation, I think, between people wanting to get involved. And then we also have certain things like, you know, venomous snakes. So we have copperheads. If you get bitten by a copperhead, that's going to ruin your day. And if you get bitten by a rattlesnake, it's probably going to ruin your entire weekend, if not the rest of the week. Um, so we have those things. And, they, and we have some rather nasty bugs that give you a bit of a nip. So there's a few things to watch out for. But um, yeah, so copperheads, rattlesnakes, cotton mouse, those are the kind of main ones we see in Georgia. Hmm. So we get dogs. About... Dogs quite frequently come in, having been bitten, and have to have the, um, the anti-venom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what about the, the reptiles? Are they, are they more of a knowledgeable bunch than they are in... Uh, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not dissing the, <laughs> the UK. I was like, there's a, I'm like, I'm watching Julian but, dig himself a hole here. And I'm like, should I interject? I'm like, no, keep going, Julian. This is comedy at its best. <laughs> I stand by that, actually, because <laughs> the number one problem we see as, as vets in this country with, with our reptiles is poor husbandry. Yeah. I, think that, I think that's still true. Um, I think that we see, I think we, we generally see some improvements and, I, and I'm very protected, right? So I'm in the ivory tower of academia. So for things to come to me, they've already filtered out by first opinion practitioners. The financial restrictions have already been filtered out so by the time people come to me there's they're usually a very dedicated client and with uh with resources but yeah we still see a lot of secondary nutritional hyperparathyroidism metabolic bone disease we still see trauma cases we still see malnutrition um and if if they don't kill it before it becomes an adult then we see reproductive disease and the consequences of that animal making it to adulthood, particularly females. So, yeah, we see, we still see a lot of those sorts of issues, and most of it, most of it is ignorance, right? They just don't know, uh, rather than it being any kind of abuse or any kind of, you know, um, negligence. yeah, negligence. It's more a case of, of you know, lack of education or or they you know and the trouble is there's a lot of um advertising you know you can buy those reptile bulbs and it says you know daylight and people think oh that's that's what divers men that's that's that full spectrum daylight bulb and it's not right you know and so there's a lot mm. of those sort of marketing subtleties which is i think problematic so mm. we often actually get now we'll ask people to take photographs and videos of their setups so that, or if they can't bring it in, but take videos and pictures. And then when they come in, we can actually look at um, that kind of setup. And that's very helpful. And then our history form, I think for reptiles and birds, just the husbandry and nutrition is like three pages long. So, you know, trying to get all those details because you're right. If you can't find a predisposing factor in the husbandry and the nutrition, then go back and look again, because you're probably missing something. Mm. Right. Would you ever... You'd never see yourself going back into private practice, you said earlier. You, you no, know, I must admit, I do, I do love it. I love, um, so, you know, my, like I said, we got this fantastic hospital and, you know, we have, we have a dedicated exotic um, service. So I have two residents and usually around four students. And then I have two technicians as well. And so, so the day, their day starts, the students and the residents, their day starts pretty early. So like usually we're busy at the moment. So they're usually coming in about 6.30, 7 o'clock in the morning. They're processing all the cases, making sure everything's got its treatments, making sure the medical records are written up. And then I roll in about 8, 8.30. And then we sit down and we have rounds. And so we discuss all the cases. And then we do our workups or our appointments. And then to put it in perspective, currently we have four appointment slots a day. Okay. Now, those of you in private practice would laugh, right? But we have four appointments. So you say you have four appointment slots an hour. That's, that's not many, is it? No, no, no. no. I'm, I have four appointment slots between nine o'clock and three o'clock in the afternoon or whatever. Yeah. And so, and then, um, so we have appointments and then the other resident will be doing uh, workups and surgeries and then we reconvene 
But, you know, we've got you know, CT, we've got 3T MRIs, we've actually got a 7T MRI available as well. We've got 24-7 ICU and IMC. We have dedicated pharmacy with pharmacists. I mean, it's just... It's just a wonderful place to work. Every, the people are phenomenal as well. And, you know, it's physically impossible, physically impossible for me to get from my car when I park and get into my area of the hospital without having to say good morning or reciprocating a good morning gesture to at least a dozen people. So everyone's very friendly. Um, and so... Uh, and it's nice to be able to do, you know, on hospital duty mm. and then off hospital duty and then doing research. And, you know, they let me do things like write textbooks or travel and lecture. And so there's a lot of freedom. So I would have a hard time, I think, going back, um, sure. you know, but um, so, no, I do love it. I, mean, I actually joke with my wife. I said, if we won the Georgia lottery, we won like two hundred million dollars. I would still go to work every day. You know, she wouldn't. She'd be off like a shot. But <laughs> I would still be going to work every day. <laughs> you know, and I think that's I think that's the best thing, right? I mean, if you can say that you enjoy your job that yeah. much that you'd go in even if yeah. you didn't need the money, then yeah. you don't really work a day in your life, to be honest. Yeah, you enjoy the teaching yeah. as well, though, don't you? So I do like I do like the teaching, and um, but my um, my philosophy of teaching, I think, comes from influences, particularly the British SAS. So my approach to teaching follows the British SAS, which is I psychologically destroy them and then rebuild them in my own image. That's kind of my approach. And, and of course, you pay attention to the, the uh, seven Ps. The seven Ps? The seven Ps. So the, the, the UK Army uh, thrives on this. Proper planning and preparation prevent piss poor performance. That says a lot for veterinary ramblings, doesn't it? <laughs> it does, doesn't it? <laughs> okay, but but the gin's gone up my nose there. <laughs> <laughs> we we better move on from that. But I think I think we get into the stage that we could do the. Um, CPD certificate. What do you think, Mike? We, we we probably should do the CPD certificate at this point in time. I mean, wow, what an evening at CPD! Our, our, our regular viewers will will know that we um, uh, we, we are a CPD provider, and so Absolutely. as such, we give you a, a CPD certificate, and it's tailor made each uh, each time. So here we go. This is uh, a certificate of diverse CPD, and what we can do is we can actually cross off. So hang on, hang on. Just so I'm clear, you're telling me that people actually get, I can't, this isn't true, right? People can get a certificate, but they're not actually getting CPD for this, surely. CPD? Yeah. This is CPD. This what is approved. This is approved CPD. If people put this down on their RCVS, CE or CPD diary, they get credit for it. Is that what you're telling me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you guys have just blown that for 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 ridicule out of the water i mean i can't believe it we try and top everything so we've got look, there we go cpd of divers cpd today we've covered all sorts of stuff and shown incredible diversity gosh aren't we good and it's got him and me and there we go there's a, there's a komodo dragon uh, there is that is a komodo dragon we haven't talked uh, about that, that, that dragon. That looks, yeah. That's a chameleon. I'm trying to work out if that's a – is that a Parsons chameleon? I can't really tell. Or is it's that a Yemen? It's not a Parsons. It's not a par- – is it a, a Mayers? Yeah. And, and there's a picture of a snake. And I thought this was quite good because this, this tells us what we need to do to make this class as CPD. This snake is yeah. reflecting. You yeah. see? Okay. I, I don't know whether you have to do that in the, in the States, but we, we can't just – absorb cpd we have to reflect on it after we've been to a lecture or after we've read something yeah we, 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 can't, just, we can't just present it or or or, or listen to it we, we in the uk it it is required that you reflect upon the cpd that you've received or or given hmm. okay I can, I can do that okay There, that's so. There we go. That's me done. There we go. I affected pretty quickly. CPD. I, I found that strangely, strangely refreshing. <laughs> it's nice, isn't it? It's, it's good. pleasant. It sort of consolidated the whole um, 
and everything. I hope it makes sense to everybody. I'm sure it will. I think it would. If you have any questions, please direct them to Professor Stephen J. Divers. If you have any positive comments, please <laughs> send them to Mike and myself. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, uh, Steve, it's been fantastic seeing you tonight. It really has. It's been brilliant. We, we, we need people to, to remember that you have edited the, um, uh, the new Maiders. Yeah, let me, let, Julian, Julian, let me hold it. Let me hold it up because you're just you holding hold up that. something that looks fake. It's right? So this, this is the Oh, actual, here we go. There you go. Yeah. See, that's the real thing. Third and this edition. actually, this weighs just under five kilos. In fact, in some states, this is classified as a lethal weapon because if you hit someone on the head with this, that's it. It's all over. But that, that's, a, that's how much it weighs. All 1,500 pages and 100 and, I don't know, 84 chapters. You, it's you a did good... well not to have to slip into two, uh, two volumes for that. Well, so that, there was that discussion, but that, that becomes, you know, they don't like to do that if they can help it. They certainly don't like to do it. But the anyway, it's a, you it's a cure. You grab the book, you grab the book, you look in the index, you think, oh, it's in the other volume, isn't it? Right, exactly, yeah. Always, yeah. Always. But it's a, um, I think it's a cure. I think it's a good cure for insomnia. And like you said, I think in the U.S. it's $180, which means in the U.K. it's probably, what, £120 or something? Uh, it's been more like £180. Is it really? Okay, so it's £180 if you can get an unsigned one. If you get a signed one, they're only worth about five. So try and get yourself a, an unsigned copy, and it's, uh, I think they're, they're, they're worth their weight in gold. We haven't done the joke yet. Oh, there's a joke? Oh, oh, oh the joke. I always always tell a, yeah. a crap joke at the end of it. Thought, I thought the entire hour and a half <laughs> was supposed to be the joke. There's, a, there's, there's something in addition? <laughs> yeah. There's something in addition. Okay. All right. Yeah, no, come I'm, on. I'm looking I'll, forward to this. Come on, Tony. I'll tell quite a, a quick one because we, we don't know what the internet's going to be like. But, but I thought, let, let, let's, let's do something a little bit exotic. So right. I'm going to do the joke about the snail who wants to buy a Ferrari. And he goes into the Ferrari showroom. He says, so I've saved up a bit of money. Uh, I want a Testarossa. And so that'll date the joke. Uh, and I want, a, I want a, a, a red Testarossa. But could you, could you paint a big S on, on the front of it? And the salesman said, well, it's your money. You can paint an S wherever you like. Really? So what about on the back? Yeah. What about on the sides as well? Could you paint a big S on the side? You can paint a big S on all of it. And the roof? Yeah, we, we, it's your money. We, we can put an S. Why, why do you want S's all over it? Well, because when I drive out with my new Ferrari, I want everyone to look at it and say, wow, look at that S cargo. You know, this re you just reminded me of a, of a client I saw with snails. I had a client come in. This wasn't at Elance. This was at the Exotic Animal Center in... in um, in uh in essex i had a client comes in and you know with a tupperware and i swear to god this is true she comes in with a tupperware container and i lift the lid off and there's a limp leaf of lettuce and there's a snail in there and this woman proceeds to tell me that there's something wrong with a snail and this, i mean my my level of snail medicine doesn't go beyond you know, is it alive or dead? I mean, it was just, I was fairly basic, but she was convincing, she was concerned because she said the snake was lethargic and had a tendency to only move to the left, right? And so I'm there in the exam room and I'm trying to kind of push this process through because I couldn't really, I said, and I, and I made the mistake because I thought, silly of me, I thought this was one snail of a colony. Most people don't have just one invertebrate usually. There's usually a, a number of them. So I made the mistake of recommending an elective necropsy to, to find out what was wrong. And this owner just got very upset with me and, and was very concerned. And then she tried to tell me that this animal was, was lethargic and always go to the left. And I said, well, and it wasn't moving, obviously, because it was on. And we sat there and she made me sit there for 10 minutes and while she is reciting and, and giving verbal encouragement for this snail to move. 
And then we're both staring at it. And about six minutes later, she suddenly shouts, there it is, there it is, he's moving, he's moving. I couldn't perceive anything. But it just came back to me that that was a repressed memory that I've managed to bury for probably 18, 20 years. But you coming up with that story just kind of pulled it back to the front. So I've cured you. I've cured your repression. Uh, I'm not it's sure if it's a cure, but anyway, yeah. That's just fantastic. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, snails, I don't think, have vestibular apparatus, do they? I mean... Well, I just, I mean, <laughs> I was lost for words. I mean, I'm not usually lost for words, but I'm like, you know, and I, and when she eventually went, I said to the reception staff, I said, you have got to give me a heads up when these things are coming in. I mean, if it's, you know, anything outside of the, I mean, I mean, we're talking about exotic pets, so everything is kind of outside the, the ordinary. But I said, anything that's just like way outside of left base or something, that you need to give me a heads up. But anyway, that was surprising. He said, oh, I should tell you about the planaria one you've got there at 450. Right. <laughs> yeah. That's brilliant. Hey, Steve. Thanks a million. All right. You're going to go home and play Thanks. Lego with you. Okay, I'm going to go. Right? Yeah, well, I've actually got consoles to do. It's 5.30 in the US now, so I've still got work to do. But anyway, it was a pleasure to see you guys again. Hopefully, I'll meet you again at some conference in the future. And uh, stay healthy. Don't go and contract COVID or do anything stupid. And uh, I'll see you soon. See you soon. May, may, Bye, your dog, may your dog go with you, Steve. Okay. May your dog Cheers. go with you, Steve. Thank you very uh, much indeed. Have fun. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good night. Cheers. Bye. Bye. <laughs> See you, mate. Cheers. Take care. Thanks, Cheers. Thanks so much for coming on. <laughs> oh, that was awesome. That was absolutely fantastic. Steve was absolutely brilliant. He was exactly what I thought he would be. Um, and more. But um, he, was, he was brilliant. Um, he, he has developed a bit of a, an American twang, hasn't he? No, that's more like... Um, it's 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 more Australian than than American. Actually, you're right. Yeah, it is. It is, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. More sort of very slow. Yes. Yeah, absolutely, mate. But he, he's he's still the same old Steve, and it uh, it brought me back to twenty odd years ago at Elands. Yeah. Brilliant. Fun. Yeah. Ah, uh, those were days. Brilliant. Was, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs>